So I'm really happy to be here today. So I'm <laughs> going to give a talk about machine learning. And um, I'm from Square. And Square is currently headquartered in San Francisco. So I'm leading a team called Data Science and Infrastructure at Square. And right now I'm actually visiting Square at New York. So I'm not sure how many of you actually know Square have a New York office. And the director of Square New York right now is Pascal, who is sitting right in the audience there. So if you are interested in visiting Square, you don't need to go to San Francisco. Go to our New York office, you can actually get a feel about like, what we are doing. Today I'm, um, yes, today I'm actually really happy to be here to really talk about some of the machine learning efforts that we are going to do in Square. And um, yeah, let me probably start a little bit from the history from Square. How many of you actually heard about Square before? That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Much better than I expected. <laughs> if you go to like San Francisco to take taxi right now, almost every taxi driver is using Square at this point. But probably not too many of you know uh, how how is Square started. Like, what's the motivation we were founded at the very beginning? It's actually in one day in 2009, like five years ago. And Jim and Jack, who was our co-founders. They actually talked to each other, and Jim was literally telling Jack that he was so frustrated that he is trying to sell a glass faucet, which is going here. He was trying to sell these keys to the other people, but unfortunately, the fail, the, he failed to do that because <laughs> he cannot take credit cards. This is like a $2,000 sale, and he cannot take credit card at that point. So what can you do? So he asked Jack, can we actually develop something in order for you to take credit card? So that's why two of them like, come together, come up with the idea that why not we just use mobile phone plus a device to take a credit card payment. And this is how Square was founded at that time. So I guess probably most of you know the device already, which is our iconic Square Reader. Very simple device, but the device is so nice that you can actually convert the credit card signals into an audio signal. And then use the audio jacks to pass the signals into, um, into our central processing service. So very nice solution. This actually makes a lot of people believe Square is actually a hardware company, which is not, actually not the case. The biggest innovation from Square is actually not the hardware, it's not the reader itself. It's actually our business model. The business model, why is new? The, the new things come from the fact that Square is actually the first merchant pro account provider who is providing an intermediate account that we will take the buyer's payments first, and then we will hand it out to our sellers as the second step. So we are basically serving as an intermediate layer of the payment system. This allows us to deposit the monies to the buyers or to the sellers on the next day. No one else can do it at that point. Everyone needs to wait for three or four days to do the processing, but only Square can do that. We do that because we build an industrial leading risk model to support this application. So we will take our risk, we will give you a better customer experience, and we will grow the products. Simultaneously, we collect more data. This helps us to build an even better risk model. So by combining these three factors together, here comes Square. And this is how Square become more and more popular than what it used to be. And we did not stop there. So think about that. So originally, we are trying to build a payment system in order to solve people's challenges of not being able to accept credit card. But there's a lot more challenges that our merchants were facing. So for example, for a lot of mo local merchants that we are working together with right now, they cannot sell their products globally. <laughs> they cannot, if a San Francisco merchant, they cannot sell things into New York. So that's why we create Square Market. That allows them to put the items on the online storefronts so can, they can have a free e-commerce portal that allow them to sell products, literally online, with one single click. And we also realized that people, it's very difficult to, for people to exchange money. So that's why we create Square Cash. So you can now literally transfer money by using email transfer. As simple as sending an email to the other people. So that's how like, we are trying to break in rules again and again by providing new services that the other people did not expect before. So if we put everything together, we did not view ourselves as a hardware company. We did not view ourselves as a payment company. We actually view ourselves as a commerce company. And our mission here is that it's trying to make commerce easy. So what does it mean? It means that commerce essentially is trying to communicate or exchange values between seller and buyers. That's about it. 
and it should be as simple, as easy, as user frictionless, as communicating, as daily communications. So we should just make seller and buyer have <coughs> very easy platforms to communicate their values from each other. And this is what we are striking for. So what are the next big things here? We are talking about payments, we have square market, we have square cash. Let's reverse engineering the problem, the problem a little bit. Let's think about what's the challenges that our merchants are currently facing. Actually, there is a lot of challenges that the merchant is currently facing right now. So for example, how can you acquire new customers that you are not familiar with? And how can you keep your existing customer keep coming into your store? And how do you detect the fraudulent activity? And how do you deliver some of your promoted items to the existing customers and tell them, okay, there is a great promotion I have today. Can, I, can, can you come to my store and take a visit over that? So very difficult problem, but I think we can do that. The reason why we can do that is because of data. So once we have the data, once we have a customer relationship database, once we have all the transactional information about it from the end-to-end -end purchasing funnels of the customers, we actually know a lot about the customer and the buyer itself. So and this allows us to create the kinds of a data products that can differentiate it from the other, the other like general payment company, the other solution, the other payment general company can provide. And this is why we think data could be a next big thing for Square. Of course, I want to give you a little bit more detail why Square is such a unique place that can enable data that the other people cannot do. So first thing is that, first thing is about data scale. We already hand out three million, more than three million of readers, Square readers to our merchants right now. And then we are processing more than, more than 30 billion of annualized uh, uh, payments to our merchants. So let me put this number into context. This number means that, so there's only 10 million of a small and medium uh, sized merchants in US right now. That's 3 million. It's actually a lot. It's actually a significant piece of the market. And also, we also realize there is only 55% of the uh, merchants who can take credit cards. There's another 45% of merchants who are not taking credit cards, they only take cash. So this happens a lot in New York City here, I realize that also. <laughs> and I think those are the great opportunities that we can, we, can, uh, we can fix and we can provide a much nicer solution for them and allow them to start to take credit card payment. And I think Square is definitely one of the potential ways to do it. And as a return, we are collecting a lot of data to enable it. And another thing I want to point out here is that Square is a unique place that we can access the offline data and the online data simultaneously. Think about that. How many people can actually access your payment amount, locations, and credit score, and your, and your inventory information at the same time? Very few people can do that. Very few internet companies can do that, or very few payment companies can do that, but we can. We are one of the few places that can access the offline information and the online information at the same time. So this allows us to get a holistic view of the user payment history from online and also offline. And this will help us to I mean, build up the foundations to build the data products that we want and connect the people from offline channels to the online channels. Let me give you some idea about like what kind of data do we have actually so um, that we can use that to extract additional insights. And this is the sales volume data that was, on, I mean, we overlaid it on the US map. We collected it from one of the Thursday afternoon for one hour of our data. The bigger the circle, the more sales volume you can get. So you can see there is a lot of big circles surrounding on the west coast. And also on the east coast, you can also see there's a lot of the transactions that was happening there. And this is a very sort of an interesting um, set of information that we can provide. And it's probably harder to read directly from this graph. Let me give you a very concrete example. What can you find out from our data? <coughs> haircut price. So if you specifically look at all the haircut transactions from all the places all over the countries, you can find out very interesting patterns. So the first pattern you can find 
Let me see. So what's the uh, what's the first pattern you think you can find from this graph? Can I ask that question to the audience? Women take women. That's great. Women takes uh, women will typically spend more money than men when they have their haircuts. Big surprise. <laughs> okay, so I guess like most people will know that if you have a girlfriend or your wife. <laughs> and, but I think there are some, some more interesting observations you can get out from this graph. So one of the things is that if you look at the difference between the haircut price between women and men, New York actually have the biggest difference right now. So that's a very interesting observation. Uh, and we, don't, we don't have a good explanation for that yet, so, but maybe this is a much more nicer modern places then women will spend more time to, to do haircut and men don't have time to do haircut and they spend less money on that. So, but it's interesting to find it out. And also there's another interesting observation, it's about tipping. Not, actually not everyone do tippings when they are doing their haircuts. But if they pay tips, typically it's more than 20%. So it's actually higher than most of the tippings in the restaurant. So I mean, I just want to use this one as an example to tell you what kind of insights we can extract from Square's data. So you can, you can see like there's a lot of useful information we can get it out from there. And it will be useful for us to build all the customer behavior study. It will be used to build a predictive analytics product that we want to have. And also can build out the fraud detection models that we want. So I thought there's a question. So what observation do you have? Probably you have more square readers in West Coast than East Coast. That's probably one of the observations. Yeah, that's, uh, I agree that's probably the case because we actually have a bigger circles than the East Coast. Yeah, that's good. So after we have so many data, then you can actually do a lot of things afterwards, right? So, um, for example, you can use the data that we have to detect fraud. That's a very straightforward use case. How can we under the fraudulent activities of our users? You can also provide the business insights for the merchants. So for example, you can tell them um, what's your future sales volumes of your, your company. And like, do you, should you buy some? Should you open a new store? Or should you extend a business hour like that? And also, you can maintain the customer relationships by maintaining a buyer database. I mean, by maintaining all their favorite items and what's their pre pre previous purchase behavior and all put it into one single buyer database. And finally, you can do the information discovery. So you can help them to, we can build a recommendation engine to recommend what are your favorite items based on your previous purchase behavior in this case. So there is actually a lot of things we can do in order to turn the data into business value in this case. So that's why, um, I mean, internally, we already have a lot of uh, interesting ideas to build around the data that we have. And recently, we just posted an article in Wired, and literally just two days ago, uh, about how Square is leveraging data to improve our business. <coughs> if you are interested in that, feel free to go to do a search on the Wired article and take a look at some of the details that how, what's the strategies behind it and how we're going to use data to leverage our, I mean, to improve our business and improve the seller and buyer experience. So now, let me do a deep dive on like, how do we use machine learning to handle our industrial leading fraud detection system. So fraud detection is one of the most critical use cases <coughs> for Square because we are dealing with a lot of payments every day. And then we need to find out what are the fraudulent activities for the users and just frozen those users and simultaneously you don't want to froze, you don't want to freeze the bad, uh, the, the good user also, because uh, at the end you can freeze everyone, but we are not going to do any business at all. So you need to find out a trade off between a false alarm and a precision. <coughs> so this is some of the data that we have nowadays. We have about like, um, 115,000 uh, active users per day. And then we pass that information to go through our fraud detection engines, which is powered by our machine learning system. And then we are going to suspect about 2,000 users every day. We send that list to 
the risk operators to do a manual transaction really. And the risk operator will actually make a decision which one should be frozen and which one should not be frozen. We pick about 100 of them to freeze every, every day. And then we send almost everyone else to clear for settlement for the bank. So you have a question still. Yeah, do you have like a hard quota or a hard absolute value of how many sellers you tag yeah. on a daily basis? No, we don't have a hard quota. So I think the question is, that, do you have a hard quota for how many sellers are going to tag every day? And right now, we don't have a hard quota. We only have a so-called soft quota in the sense that we are actually using a classification threshold to make a decisions how many sellers you want to tag. So for example, during the weekend, we have less sellers to tag. Right? During the weekend, we have more. But uh, as long as we control to the range we are talking about, then our risk option has enough uh, human resource to handle. So you have a target, and then you tune the algorithm to kind of revolve, average out so that it pulls a certain amount of sellers. We actually don't, uh, it's not as fancy as that. So we just like have a fixed threshold. And then we just use that fixed classification threshold to determine how many sellers we have. Uh, so I think sometimes we could go as high as 250, or uh, 2,500. Or sometimes it could go as low as 1,500. But I think those are reasonable. If it's going to 5,000, <coughs> then we haven't seen those cases yet. Okay. Okay. I'm just wondering, um, this uh, flow mm -hmm. seems to be pivoted on sellers. Mm -hmm. When fraud could be happening um, from the um, buyers also. That's right. Yep, very good questions. So uh, the question is that whether we uh, this whole flow is focused on seller. So what if we have five buyer flows also? So the I mean I I need to give a little bit more explanations here. So in fact the buyer flow is taken care by the client, like Visa and Masters. What we are focusing on here is the seller flow. So because <coughs> Visa and Master will take that responsibility and then if they tell you that buyer don't have any fraud, they will pass that to us. And then we will actually take the uh, okay, we take the responsibility to give the money to our seller. And at that time. But the chargeback of the seller can come in like three, I mean three months later. So in that case, if we see chargeback, then we need to take those money back. But you can see also at that point the seller might bankrupt already or they might not be in business or they might have a lot of issues. So that's why we are going to lose the money because of that. But you can see we lose money because of the seller instead of losing the money because of the buyer. So I hope that actually The data from the ops okay. goes back into the engine to uh, classify the transaction. <coughs> that's exactly the thing. Yeah, so you can see we actually have two. The question. Okay, so um, the question is that does the data from the risk offs actually come back to the system as the training data that we have? So the question, yeah, I think the, the, it, it's actually the case. So we actually have two kinds of ground truth data for our training process here. So one is the chargeback data provided by our bank, by our banking partners. And that's the real data, real ground truth, but you can only get that three months later. It's going to take you a long time to collect those data. For the risk ops data, it's less of a ground truth because it's relying on manual, manual review and manual feedback. There are certain error rates there, but you can get it on the other day. So, so you trade off these two kinds of training data. One is a fast arrival, a fast arrive training data, less accurate. And the other is a slow arrive training data, more accurate. How do you combine these two things together? It's a very interesting question that we are actually trying to figure out. So how many questions can I take now, or should I just take all the questions? Okay. Oh, uh, whatever you think is best, if you want to. Okay. Yeah. Why, not, uh, why not I leave some of the questions to the end of the talk? So. But feel free to interrupt me if you have some other questions. Okay. okay, so this is our machine learning architecture. So first, we are going to collect all the information source that we have. We talk about we have a lot of data source here. And then we throw that into a machine learning services to generate our features and also run our classifiers. And at the end, we're going to generate those features. So we generate about three, more than 300 features in order to do, the, um, to do the machine learning rankings that we want to have. Let me give you a little bit idea about what kind of features that we are generating right now. So these are just some examples of the features that we can generate. For example, whether you are using a credit card to make the payments or not, car present or non car present. Uh, you can use the so-called pen diversity. Pen reason means the 
literally means the, the credit card number, the first 12 digits of the credit card number, I think. So how diverse is your card payments? It's also a very interesting feature that you can use during the process. And whether you are using iPhone to do payments or using iPad or using the other mobile device, this could be another feature. So you can see there's, you can divide, define a lot of features based on the information source that we are collecting. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. And let's talk about what kind of model we are using to, to do the process. I mean, right now we are using random forest and boosting tree to do it, but stuff, I mean, in order to describe random forest, we need to start with a decision tree model. So I think probably uh, most of you know decision tree model already, right? So how many of you know that? So, so none of you know decision tree? Yes. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I, my, my suspicion for this audience, like most of you should already know decision tree, so. That's so the opposite question. That's the opposite question, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> yep. But I just like, um, I'll give you some quick idea about what's the advantage, why do you should be used decision tree. So first, very easy to interpret the, the structures. I mean, this is great. And also, you can do dimension reductions by <coughs> just going through that uh, decision tree, so by remembering, not remembering the data, like what KUS neighbor is doing, but you, instead you remember the structures. So you can do a pretty effective dimension reduction on top of it. And it's a very powerful in ensemble, combined with the ensemble algorithm. That's why like random forest or boosting tree has been a, such a successful like classification algorithm in, in our current literature. So, and if you just combine a bunch of decisions together, you will get random forest. So um, yeah, we probably don't need to go into too much details on like how do you construct it. Oh no, so how do you how do we do this like graph? So but I want to talk about a little bit about the exact process. How do we build the decision tree at random forests in this case? So first you start with a bunch of training data. Like let's assume that's a training data that you have. And you first want to uh, come up with a small sample set of the training data. So there's a lot of different choice for, I mean, uh, building random forests here, but in this case, our sample set will be smaller than the original training set. So we are not thinking an exact full size of a bootstrapping sample. And then you're going to randomly sample a square end of the features also. So you're doing another sampling on the feature space to make the feature size to be smaller. So and then you use that to find out what's the best split between these two things. So use your favorite criteria to, to find out the split. So you can use Gini index or you can use like information games, choose your favorite one. And grow the tree, make it bigger. So when do we stop? We stop when there's not enough sample size inside each of the terminal node. So that's the time we are going to terminate our entire tree growing process. So finally, just repeat those steps in order to grow our random forest into a much bigger random forest in this case. And this was the model that we have been using for a long time. And we are still having that model running in our production system right now. Questions? What's N approximately in your case? And it's about 300 to 400 right now. So that's a, the number of features that we're talking about. So the question is, that what's the N approximately in my cases? So we also talk about boosting tree here. So I mean, as a natural extension of random forest, running boosting on top of the tree is going, I mean, there's a lot of a, a previous study already showing that boosting can improve the performance. And this is also something we tried recently. And uh, the basic idea for boosting, I guess probably a lot of you also have a brief idea on that. So basically, you need to run a weighted sampling <coughs> on each of the steps with more and more focus on the misclassification data so that each of your new classifier is going to capture the errors that you are making from the previous classification, uh, the previous classifier that you built before. So you keep doing that, keep focus on the misclassification, misclassified data, and finally you come up with a boosting trees that can capture the, uh, all the misclassification of the errors that you have been making in this process. So this is just give you some like nice animations on how boosting tree is going to work. So at the end, boosting tree is trying to optimize the exponential loss functions, and that's a very nice statistical interpretation why these two things are equivalent with each other. 
Yeah, I'm probably not going into the details here. Here's some result comparison between these two things. So we run <coughs> random forest, and we also run boosting trees. Um, we are running that on how much? Probably tens of millions of training data right now. So April means and June means like the three different testing that we are using. So it means the testing that was creating from just like three different months right now. So you can actually see that the boosting tree, um, it's noticeably outperformed the random forest is classified. Yes? Um, how many trees in the random forest? How many tiles in the boosting tree? Yeah, so how many trees, I mean the question is that how many trees do we have in the random forest and how many trials do we have in the boosting tree? So um, for the random forest of we actually try a lot of different settings. I think the production setting we are using is 600 trees right now. So, but we also try 200, we also try 1,000, 200, so I think the difference here is not that big. And also for boosting, uh, the number of trials is about the same. So when we are comparing these two things, we always make sure that these two numbers are actually each other. Yep. Yep. I'm curious about the performance over time. Yep. In fact, is there you fit in this model for every month or frequency and then also like what kind of requirements there yep. in terms of making sure they don't uh what we don't want to have period of time making the expectation of time. So the question is that like he's curious about how are we going to uh, what's our typical retraining process here? Like, so what's the performance over time? Like, will, will the performance degrade it, like over time if we did not retrain the model over and over again? The, uh, the answer is yes. So if you did not retrain this model, if you did not retrain this model in time, the performance will degrade it. But the degradation rate is actually is at least much slower than expected. So for example, if you right now if you use a model that was training Let's say using the data by the end of uh, 2012, compared with model using the data changing by the end of 2013, um, the difference will not be as significant as you expect. So there is still some some difference there. So but that's why we keep retraining. So we are probably retraining on a monthly basis, but that's about it. So you don't need to change on a daily basis. Okay. So along that lines, yeah. How long does it take to train? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I can yeah. have a slide on that. Right? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll keep that as and then that's fine. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Is there a seasonality part that we also know? The seasonality is actually, I okay, the question is that how does the seasonality affecting the training performance? Here? So the seasonality is definitely uh, a big factor here. So typically, for example, we are going to see a higher risk rate, I think. Let me remember what's the right direction here. So um, typically on December, we have the lowest like risk rate. So a lot of good customers coming in on December to do the, I mean, some of the Christmas day sales or something like that. So you can see the risk rate is smaller. And we are going to see a higher risk rate on January. So um, we're still trying to figure out why January is such a special month. Yeah. Is it related to some kind of product? It's definitely related to the usage patterns here. So, and then a lot of, uh, there are some special months, people are doing some different things. So for example, also related to the events, it's also related to the holidays, I mean, how, what's the holiday patterns. So for example, January, I think, I forgot which event is that, right? So, um, but there are some specific things that was happening on January that was like having a, a cost a spike of a risk rate. And after that, after February, then it will, it will turns out it's going up, I mean, it will go down after. So uh, I forgot the exact reasons, but definitely some, some external factors. Sorry, uh, when you measure performance, mm -hmm. it's based on cases essentially, right? Mm -hmm. How many cases do you say fraudulent versus not? Have you seen vari <coughs> variance in performance across the size of the charge? Yep. So uh, the question is that whether we see like different kind of performance against the size of the charge here, definitely. So I think uh, the size of the charge is a very important factor is related to the performance here. That's why we put size of the charge as a uh, ranking features in our algorithm also. Um, typically, I would say 
um, smaller size of the, the, the size of the charge, if the size of the charge is like smaller, then the risk rate is actually higher. And if you have a larger size of a charge, then the risk rate is actually smaller. It's actually a reverse relationship to the future. Okay, let's move on. This is actually the recall curve. Um, the two algorithm here. So you can see the, the x axis is the number of payments to reject, and the y axis is the fraud. Uh, the, the fraudulent dollars that has been prevented by the algorithm, the higher the better. So you can see actually the boosting tree was outperforming the random forest mostly in the medium risky users in this case. And they perform relatively similar to each other <coughs> on the easy case and also on the hard case. So just give you some understanding about what's the recall curve you're going to see. And also some interesting lessons we learned from this process, especially on data sampling. So first, this is a really highly skilled data set. So we only have a one risky cases out of 1,000 transactions, sometimes even less than that. So you need to handle this like rare categorization uh, sample problem. So one of the simple things you can do is to use weighted sampling algorithm. So either up sample or up weighted the positive sample or down weighted the negative sample. It turns out it doesn't work so well. So if you put them a higher weight on positive sample, it will cause some oscillations in the boosting process. If you put them a lower weight on the negative sample, it doesn't show you the real gain. So at the end, we just go ahead to do the down sampling for the negative data. That's actually, a, I mean, probably one of the most simple solutions. It turns out to be the most effective solutions. We are always keeping the negative ratios to be about three to one percent, three, three to one ratios, or 10 to one ratios. So that's one of the, I mean, we don't have any theoretical guarantee this is the right ratio for you to use, but this is our sort of practical observations. And it seems to work pretty well on the data sets that we have right now. And fewer data typically require fewer resource to change, which is true. And also, if we are increasing the, um, increasing the ratio, negative to positive ratio to 20 to 1, we actually see a drop of uh, recall rate by 10%. So, and this, this result seems to be consistent across like, a number of uh, months <coughs> of training data that we are testing right now. So again, so I don't think we have any theoretical guarantee to prove that that's true yet, but it's a good practical sort of uh, consideration that you might want to consider if you want to run the same algorithms for yourself. Good question. Sure. What, uh, I'm not sure what weights are referring to. So uh, what weight we are so okay, the question is that what's the meaning of the weight in that case? So the meaning of weight here is that like if you don't want to downsample the data, in order to solve the skilled data set uh, problem, then you need to like apply an additional multiplication weight on top of each of the data instance weights. So you can say for your positive data you can apply a higher weight, maybe a ten times weight or one hundred <laughs> times weight. So you have on your two multiplication. Yeah. You have algorithms, one for selecting positive, yep. um, uh, uh, whatever, uh, positive and, and another one selecting like, you know, fraud, and the, uh, the whatever weights you apply. So, I mean, the weight in this case means that, like, um, I guess if you are familiar with the boosting algorithm, you can see in each of the iterations, we are actually applying some weight on top of each of the data instance in order to build the target model. In that case, you actually are applying the weight so that you can get a higher sampling rate of that instance in order to build a new class. So maybe this is, this is probably for me to study a moment, I guess. That's right. Yeah. Maybe you can check more offline on this one. I think this is a pretty standard process for you to solve the uh, skill data set distribution problem. Question. Yep. Any other questions? Great. So we talk about machine learning, we talk about algorithm, but another important piece is here is actually productionalizing the machine learning algorithm in system. This is actually, uh, I would say this is probably a very important thing in, if you want to run machine learning in a production environment. So let me talk a little bit about the lessons that we, we learned or the practice we are using in general. So at the very beginning, when we build up our machine learning system, we use a, what we call so-called startup architectures, which is, Probably most of the startup companies we use. You build Ruby on Rails on MySQL. 
and then you do a lot of select star from your database and then get everything into memory and then just run a simple algorithm on top of it boom you get a result that's probably most of people will use like when your company is small and then I mean when your data set was slowly going up okay you do my single replications so you have Q minus D, D minus D, D. you slowly making things a little bit more and more complicated and then you realize replication is so difficult to keep everything in sync then that would be the times that you will find out there are some things you need to change in you know, order to make things become more efficient. Okay, so and also there's a lot of problem for this approach because everything was just so tied to the production schema here. Everything will be related to your data schema. If one people change your data table schema, you need to change almost everything else. And if you, if you only have two people maintaining your database, that's fine. But if you have 100 people to do it, you're not, this is not going to work. And very hard to do complicated analysis. If you turn out to have a features, then you need to do a lot of complicated analysis to generate that features. This approach is not going to work. So that's why we have the sad faces. How to change that to a happy faces? Okay, that's how we scale it out. So we first change, we build Java services. We change that to a services uh, oriented architectures. <coughs> And so Java is our choice. You can do the other kind of services, but Java actually runs pretty well. I mean, some of us are building the Go services also, which also runs pretty well. Uh, if you are a big fan of Go, feel free to use that. And each of the services will provide an API. And also, we are going to serve our data from HDFS. And so HDFS is one of our major data store right now to serve our data at this point. And building on top of that, you can use your favorite query engines, you can use Hive, I mean, possible query engine. Or you can use Presto. Or you just consume, you can use JDBC to consume the data directly. That's also another choice. After you store the data into the HDFS or the other, or any data stores that you have, you also need to do the data transport. So that's why we actually developed two solutions here. So one is, uh, we use two solutions. One is the append only feeds. This is an in house implementation of, uh, it's one of the square solutions that uh, we are using to transfer the data from one service to another service and make sure everything was in sync. So, one simple example is that if one user was changing their phone numbers on the web page, you probably want all the related services to subscribe to this feed and make changes simultaneously. So, this is how we can enable in general. And also, another things we are using, another system we are using is Kafka coming from Linkings. This is also using in some of our data uh, use case right now. So if your data use case doesn't really care about uh, data loss, I mean, or you allow certain degree of data loss, and Kafka actually provide a much better degrees of uh, uh, replications and scalabilities on top of it. So it's a totally different kind of use case. Rep we are still keeping MySQL replication, still remains to have pain points, but I don't think, uh, but at least at this moment, I think we can live with, it, live with it at this point. And we are using proto buffers to communicate the data across different services. I mean, I know some people use script, some people use ProBuff, but ProBuff is our choice. I think it works pretty well right now. Highly availability. So essentially, our machine learning services contain a lot of uh, services, probably five or six services altogether. Like one service is, is used to generate the features, another service is used to run the machine learning classifiers, and another service is, is trying to subscribe all the feeds that was related, and then pump that into our feature services. So it has to be highly available. If it's not running on a date, you will get an email from Jack telling you, we are losing a lot of money because of you guys. So, you, so we need to make it highly available, it will never fail. So this is how we do it, we have a parallel environment. So what we call a green and blue environment. So we always use only one of the environments to produce the production traffic, but we keep the other environments just running. So why do we want to do that? It actually serves a couple of purposes. So one is that we are going to make sure the data is correct. We are always checking the features we're generating from these two environments and verifies whether the features are, like, uh, are about the same with each other, at least the range is about the same with each other, so they can make sure none of the feature, all the features are generated correctly. 
So and if you happen to see one of the environment, and this is also for the di disaster recovery cases, right? So if you happen to see one of the environment is broken, or for some reason it's not running, and you can quickly switch to another environment and start to run things from there. So this is why the parallel environment is so important to us, especially if we want to enable a very robust environment for machine learning. This is a very necessary step for you to do, to do a highly available cost. So before I go into the other machine learning applications, I want to see whether there's any questions. Yes. Uh, there, there's lots of e-commerce companies doing uh, using a third party yep. for risk protection as a service, mm -hmm. including Uber and Airbnb and a few others. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Is that too poor to you guys to outsource to someone else? And yep. Essentially, they're running the same algorithm. I think what the. Think so. Um, yeah, I think this is actually, I think the question is that, uh, I mean, a lot of companies are e-commerce, especially e-commerce companies are using the third-party solutions to run risk uh, detections applications. And uh, why do we want to build things in-house, right? So I think uh, there are several things here. So it's, first, it's related to engineering cultures. We, are a, we have an engineering cultures that we believe, like, um, we are capable of building our own things. And then we actually want to contribute things back to the open source communities. In fact, like Square was one of the major players that has been contributing a lot of things into open source community here. And so, we, so that's why we have been really trying to think about building our own stuff. And at least we put building our own stuff as one of our first priority here. The second thing is that we have a lot of, a, when we are dealing with a payment data like this, we, I mean, payment is one of our core sort of a competitive advantage or one of our core expertise. And building risk model, as I mentioned in the second slide, like the risk model itself actually helps to differentiate ourselves with the other competitors. And literally, the Visa and Master Executive has been telling us we have the currently the best industrial leading fraud detection models of all the providers that we have. And this was like helping us to increase our profit margins and helping the other smaller merchants to be helping to build up the trust relationship with our merchants. So we believe that's why we can do better and we have the capability to do it better and that's why we do not outsource it. <coughs> so I would love to the other e-commerce company to consider us to, <laughs> to use our solutions yeah, at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. whether we are running the classifier in re real time to predict the uh, alert, so sort of provide alerts to our seller. So it's yes and no. So if I go back to the chart that I have right now, so when we are running the suspicions pipelines here, we are doing that in real time. You will get that suspicions number immediately. But we are going to batch up all the suspicion predictions into batch. I mean, uh, and then we send that to risk ops as a batch instead of sending that to our risk ops. So the reason is that like our current term of services, like we only need to deposit the money to sellers on the next day, instead of like giving them a year. So there's no such a requirement. And also from an operation point of view, it's better for you to just put everything together and present that to humans rather than keep things coming from that. And there will be some additional overhead for manual like review process. But it's possible for us to do more in real times like uh, risk detection in the future, but we need to solve the operation side of it instead of the machine learning side of the challenge. Thank you. Yep. Question. How often do you use your data back to change your model? Yep. So uh, I think how, how often do I change my data to, to change my model, to yeah. feed my data back to change my model? Um, I think this is really the one of the answer I provide to one of the questions that's supposed to be done monthly right now. So, I mean, we want to make it monthly, so sometimes it's going to be longer, sometimes it's shorter. So, but I think at least the target we're going to shoot for is like reaching our model in the last. <coughs> Question. So, what is the request value and what is the SLA for your response time? Uh, the, what's a, the SLA for my response time right now depends on what kind of services that you are talking about. So, for example, when you are talk, when we are talking about the batch services that we provide to risk operator, the SLA could be long, right? So it could be several hours. Like as long as we can provide the uh, the batch feedbacks of our suspicions by five five o'clock in the afternoon, 
then the risk loss will be heavy on that. Uh, what about this real time service? Oh, for this one? Yeah. So, specifically for the services, for the feature generation services, it has to be in like hundreds of millisecond type of range. So, because if we need to generate real time outputs, the one of the reasons behind it is because we also support the other applications, such as Square Markets and Square Cash. Like for Square Cash, you need to generate a risk uh, I mean fraud detection almost immediately. So within <coughs> seconds before you send out an email. So that's why the SLA for that kind of application will be different. Square Market, it's, a, it's an e-commerce application. So that the SLA will be also much smaller than the register application that we're talking about. Yes? Which language or tools do you use for the actual implementation? Yep. The question is that which languages do I use for my implementations here? Right now, we are using uh, the Java. I mean, we're building the Java services for all the machine learning services right now. So Java is the major language we <coughs> use. And on the front end, we are using Ruby, but we do not touch too much Ruby code from a machine learning perspective. But we do need to have people who build like, the Ruby front end and Ruby <coughs> services. For the frameworks that you're... For Java? Yeah. So for Java, we are actually using our own I mean, also is building in house called the Java Services Container. So that's a very nice container for you to use. So I'm not, I'm not sure if you have any kind of open source or not, but I think that's a pretty nice way. Okay, let me move on to talk about some other machine learning applications that we use in Square here. So first is Square Random Forest. And this is a very, I mean, I'm, I'm personally very excited about this development here. So basically, we are building our in-house random forest implementations uh, and for random forest. And let's go back to our philosophy here. We believe we have the right engineering resource to build the uh, in-house solutions. And we actually, before we do that, we're actually using some uh, 3D standard of the shelf solutions like Scikit-Learn or uh, uh, WiseIO. Uh, Wise, uh, WiseIO have a solution called random wise random forest. And especially for wise random forest, it's a proprietary solution, and we need to get the license version in order to run it. And it's actually a C++ solution. So the suppose that this baseline is very difficult to fit. And instead, we are building <coughs> our own solution, which is based on Java. And you can see that based on the number I'm showing here, it's actually running faster than the C++ solutions that wise file is supporting. Of course, there are some implementation details that are different. And, but, we are, but we are really happy on that and the training performance and testing performance coming out from our in-house solutions is almost the same <coughs> with the other solutions that we have. So that's why we are switching all of our applications into the internal solutions that we are using right now. So and we are enjoying the benefit from there. Another thing that we are building is a learning management system. And this is focused on helping the non-sophisticated users to build their model. Essentially, our ideal use case is that everyone in the companies can build machine learning models. So you can actually focus on ad hoc analysis, then you can literally just submit the jobs with a hype table, and with the feature you specify in the hype table, then boom, you can build a machine learning models out of it. So that's how a learning management system can help you. So it's going to provide a central repository of all the machine learning models that we build in the company, and then aggregating everything into the same places and then we can allow the other people to check the results of the models that you are building. So this is also a system that we are building right now. And finally, recommendations. We just launched recommendation, a machine learning based recommendation system to Square Markets in this February. So if you go to Square Markets right now, you can see there is a, you may also like, um, like a row that was at the end of each of the <coughs> item page. This is supporting by our recommendation engines. So based on our, our internal evaluation result, we're providing 10 times more conversion rates compared with the random baseline. So it actually works pretty well. Right so I think that's about it. So um, very happy to have the opportunity to talk about a few of our machine learning applications and also talk about some of the new progress of our machine learning related like algorithms, systems, and some other stuff. And definitely, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me with this email. And if you'd love to know more about Square, visit our New York office, and this is our Twitter account. And of course, you, if you happen to be San Francisco, also come to our headquarters, and we're happy to host you there. So thank you very much. Yep, I want to see questions. Um, just a question about the recommendation engine. Uh, we had a talk by some people.
My feature generation happening in HDFS. Again, the question is like the answer is yes or no right now. We are currently in a transition stage that we actually want to move most of our feature generations into HDFS and uh, move into more like scalable, like high phase analysis in this case. But we still have a lot of real time feature that we want to generate online. So that's why it's, it's half half at this point. It's a hybrid version, so it's not fully on hybrid. Surprising came out from our analysis here. So I cannot come up with anything in my trial, but I can tell you definitely there's a lot of surprise we come up from the analysis. So let me think if I can come up with anything right now. So I need to remember there was like in our meeting like three months ago, we were talking about very interesting cases, but I forgot exactly what it's that. But maybe you can check more of mine. But there is a lot of surprising stuff that we don't realize. Yeah. Yep. Any other questions? How much data do I keep? Um, so it depends on what kind of data you're talking about here. So, so specifically, you're talking about transact how much transactional data we are keeping. We are keeping the transactional data since the starting of the company. Yeah. yeah. So they're keeping all the data there. So how much is it? Um, I can't tell you the scale, but it's actually a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you a lot. So it's, really it's definitely a big data problem. We are maintaining a Picture by the data, data store right now is not feeling the entire value of the Which features in the decision tree model that we found to be more closely related to the product? Okay, you're asking the right question here. Which feature is actually the most important or most useful in the top three? Decision tree model? I think this is a good time for us to take it offline. Okay, 
so um, just give you one example. It's like one of the historical features would be a, a very useful historical feature in terms of uh, uh, like the previous payment information for the users, like probably window aggregation of all the information for the users. Those are uh, one of the important features that we should think about. Does that answer your question? What was it? I didn't hear it. Why don't we take it all apart?